Hey, how you doing, econ students? This is Jacob Clifford, and now it's time to practice macroeconomics. Every year, I got people emailing me and asking me, how do I really make sure I know this stuff? Like, I, I get it, you talk about it, I read my book, it makes sense, but how can I make sure I'm ready for my next test? And the answer is simple, you've got to practice. Now, the best way to practice is actually do questions that look like the questions you're gonna see on your test. So, for AP students, take a look at the free responses that are on the College Bard website. These are released free responses for each year. And if you're in a college class, still take a look at these. This is pretty much exactly what your uh, professor is gonna give you in your classes as well. So if you can do this, you are ready. You can draw the key graphs. You understand the concepts. So right now, print out the question for 2017 for response number one. Try it on your own. See if you're getting it. Then I'll go over all the answers and help you understand and verify you're actually understanding this stuff because this is by far the best way to get ready for your test, which is to practice. So I hope you did well. Here we go. Let me go over the answers and do this. Again, we're talking about the 2017 FRQ number one for the AP exam. So this is the first free response. This is the first response students that were given this year. Uh, and you know what? It was an easy one. I hope you thought it was easy. And I hope you felt like this is something that you could handle. But uh, it, it was a relatively easy question. It started off like all free responses start off with by asking you to draw a key graph. Now, usually on the AP test, they ask you about aggregate demand or aggregate supply and drawing that graph, recessionary gap, inflationary gap. This time they did something slightly different. They asked you to draw, it's called the Phillips curve. So in in part A of question number one, they said uh, draw the Phillips curve using the numbers they gave you. So if you remember the Phillips curve, it looks like this. You start off with inflation up here and we have unemployment. So inflation and unemployment and you can see there is a negative relationship between the two. This is the short run Phillips curve. Now you should memorize this graph and know this graph. You should understand why there's also a long run Phillips curve. In the long run, there is no relationship. Uh, there's no you know, trade off between unemployment and inflation in the long run. In the short run, there is. So if you drew this graph, congratulations, you get one point. So I'm switching over to a red pen. You get one point just for drawing the graph and labeling the graph, that's it. So half the points here are not even you know, connecting it to the numbers, just can you draw this key graph one point? Now, then it tells you to use the actual numbers. Well, first you have to put 5%, which is the natural rate of unemployment. This is the amount of frictional and structural unemployment that will exist in the economy. So that's going to be the long run Phillips curve, the idea of natural rate of unemployment. And it tells you we currently have 7% unemployment in the economy, which means we're out here somewhere. And that is the idea of point B. Point B means we're out here. And since they gave you the inflation rate, you can go over here and say, what was it? 3% inflation. Now, if you have those numbers, numbers in there, that gives you another point. So right there are the two points. You get one for labeling the graph and another point for labeling point B on the graph with the numbers that they gave you. Now, when you look at this graph, you should spot that's a recessionary gap. Like your brain should go, okay, we're in a recessionary gap. 7% unemployment is higher than the natural rate of unemployment of 5%. And now in B, it starts talking about some sort of policy to change the situation that we're in. Now, if you've seen AP test questions before, you know that they do. They usually say, okay, um, what type of fiscal policy can solve this problem? What kind of monetary policy can solve this problem? Or what happens if they do no policy? And that's what they do in this. In B, they say there's no policy. What happens if the government does nothing and just waits this recession out? Well, the question says, uh, specifically, what's going to happen to the short run aggregate supply curve? Now, I want you to notice on a free response, they they, when they say the word explain, make sure to explain. Now, I circled it here. I tell my students, you circle when it says explain because you're not going to get the point unless you explain. You have to fin finish off. Not just say up or down or you know stay the same. Increase, decrease. You've got to tell them. So the short and aggregate supply in this case, it's going to increase, right? If there's no policy, eventually, if wages are flexible, eventually the aggregate supply is going to increase because there's a recession. High unemployment means that these workers out of the job and everyone's sitting around no one's being used, no resources being used. So eventually wages will fall, resource prices will fall, and that lower prices will eventually increase the output in the economy, causing the short air supply to increase. So if you just put this, you would not get the point. You had to say because. So because why? Remember, because it's an explain question, because wages, nominal wages, and resource prices will eventually fall. As those things decrease, producers can produce more stuff if there's no policy eventually. It might take a decade or two decades, but eventually the economy will turn back to full employment. Now, in question B2, it says, what will happen to the long run Phillips curve? The 
long run Phillips curve will stay the same. The uh, natural rate of unemployment is going to stay at 5%. It doesn't matter if the government just waits out the, you know, waits it out, or if they do fiscal policy or monetary policy, the natural rate of unemployment is still going to stay at 5%. That's how much frictional and structural employment we're going to have. So the natural rate of unemployment doesn't change. So the long run Phillips curve is also not going to change. Now, in C, they switch over to fiscal policy. So they ask you, uh, what is a fiscal policy that could reduce unemployment? And basically, that question saying, how can fiscal policy you know, affect and help a recession? So the answer is two different answers. You could say uh, government spending could increase, right? So one thing could increase government spending. That's a fiscal policy that can close a recessionary gap. Or you can say uh, the taxes could be decreased. Either of these are right answers. These will give you the points you're looking for. Notice if you say anything about discount rate or you know open market operations or reserve requirement, that's monetary policy. They're not looking for that. So the question's not asking what's something that can be done to reduce unemployment, to expand the economy, get out of a recessionary gap. They're not asking that. They're saying what fiscal policy, explicitly fiscal policy can be done. And the answer is increased government spending or cutting taxes. Now, you don't get a point for each one. You only get one point for, uh, you know, you had to say one of those two. And going back over here, there was one point here and another point there as well. So right now we're at grand total of five points uh, up to point C. In D, it asks you to talk about a specific graph, your favorite graph, aggregate demand and supply. They're asking you the fiscal policy you said in C, what happens on aggregate demand and supply graphs? So you have to actually draw the graph in this case. It's the most important graph in all of macroeconomics, so you know how to draw GDP real, and this is the price level. You got a downward sloping aggregate demand, upward sloping aggregate supply, short run aggregate supply, and you've got dot dot down. This is, I'll put Y1, or the quantity of the GDP, and over here I'll put PL1. That's where we currently are. Now the question didn't say where is the economy, or how do you draw aggregate demand supply? It asked you how do you show what you did in C on that graph? So you have to draw a shift in aggregate demand to the right with an arrow, and say, now we're over here, this is Y2, and price level two, price level two is there. So we went from here to here. That's a correct graph, that's what we're looking for. And it turns out that's worth two points. One point for drawing just the graph at equilibrium, and another point for showing the same uh, shift that you said in C. Now keep in mind, the AP test gives something called consistency points. Hopefully your professor does the same thing. But Let's say you messed up C and you said uh, that we're going to have to decrease government spending. You just read it wrong. Something happened wrong. You can still get points. Now, you, obviously, you wouldn't get the point in C, but you can still get both of these points if you drew the graph correctly and labeled it right. You get the first point. And then if you draw aggregate demand decreasing, you could get the second point, even though you're wrong. And the graph looks completely different than the one I drew, but it's consistent with what you already said. So keep that in mind. As you're doing a free response, Like, don't be like, oh, I don't know what to draw. I don't get this, so I'm going to draw nothing. At least draw something and stay consistent the entire time. Now in E there's an explain question again and it says what's going to happen to the supply of this country's currency based on the GDP you said in the graph you drew in D. All right. So first of all, notice the GDP went up over here. So I'm just going to write that off to the side. You didn't need to uh, put that, but you need to understand the idea that the increase in government spending or the cutting of taxes you said in C is going to lead to gross domestic product going up. In other words, we're going to reduce unemployment, the economy is going to expand, and we're going to have more GDP. Now, what's going to happen to the supply of money, well, it's going to increase. And the idea here is that whenever an economy's GDP increases, they're going to buy more things from other countries. So the reason why, and you had to have it explained to get the point here, is because there's going to be an increase of imports because GDP increased. And the idea here, remember, there's four things that change the foreign exchange uh, market for a country. Uh, tastes and preferences, if people prefer more of your stuff or less of your stuff. Price level. GDP, in this case income, like national income, if your GDP goes up, you're more likely to buy things from other countries. And so that's what's happening here. And to buy those things, you have to supply more of your currency. So supply is going to increase for this country's currency. And the reason why is because they're going to import more because they have more GDP. They're, they're, they're richer, the economy is doing better, they're going to buy more stuff from other countries. So that would be explained. And then F, to finish it off, and I'm running out of room here, in F, oh boy is what's going to happen uh, to the country's uh, currency? Well, it's going to depreciate. 
And this one, you didn't need have to you know, explain at all. You just need to know an increase in supply is gonna cause the price to fall, and this is the price of currency, and that means that currency is gonna depreciate. So basically, you didn't have to draw the graph, but you should know that the increase in supply in E is gonna cause the currency to depreciate in F. Now those are your last two points. One right here for saying supply is gonna increase and to have the explain, and another point right here to say the currency is gonna depreciate. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine points right here on this fair response. How did you do? Did you get nine out of nine? Did you get seven out of nine? Did you get two out of nine? What do you know and what do you not know? Practicing is the best way to figure out if you're really getting this stuff. Now, if you wanna watch more of your responses, you wanna watch for your response number two or three, go ahead and click right here. Also, if you want to practice more of these for responses, take a look at the Ultimate Review Packet. I made a bunch more videos going over all the your responses in macro and microeconomics to help you practice and get this stuff. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time.